again, my beautiful art-loving friends. I know I haven't posted for a while because I've been traveling around. I left Nicaragua for a while and now I am in amazing and beautiful Lisbon, Portugal. <laughs> Behind me is the um, tile museum. There's a long history of uh, making beautiful tiles here in uh, Portugal. And so we're gonna go inside and I'm gonna show you what kind of treasures there are in there to be seen. I don't know if I will be able to talk um, or have the video camera while I'm in there. So if I can't, um, I will simply take pictures and put them together for you or point and then uh, tell you a little history or information about them uh, later on when I, when I edit the video. Okay, so, so glad to be back here on my channel and remember to hit the like and subscribe button and I will look forward to showing you what I find. Bye! So here we are going into the main entrance through this beautiful courtyard. As you see the proper name for this is the Museo Nacional do Azulejo. I hope I pronounced it right. I'm sure that the Portuguese pronunciation is uh, maybe a bit different than the little bit of Spanish that I'm learning living in Nicaragua. Okay, so before we go inside and start looking at uh, real tiles, um, have a look at this beautiful uh, courtyard. The museum is housed in what was an old convent. And uh, I believe that just a few months ago when I was here in March, they did a renovation and I was not able to come because it was closed. But look at that gorgeous aged facade of this courtyard. So exciting. Okay, my ceramic friends, get ready to see some amazing, beautiful tiles. So you see what we have here is the uh, wedged clay, which will then get rolled onto the, um, onto the mold. And because it's, I think, hopefully you can see that the design is carved into the plaster. And so what will happen is that, that that clay will get flattened out and the design will be pressed into the clay, but it will be a uh, relief. And here it goes down in, and here it makes it go up in the clay. And then here is where it will be uh, painted with the glazes. And here we have the final tile after firing. Here's an example of tiles made with the, the cuerda seca technique, which seems to be uh, molded with um, hills and valleys or what we call low relief to create the design. And then it has uh, beautiful colored painting and clear, um, clear glaze over top of it to give it its, its shine. And then if we look down here in the case, there is uh, an example of a different style, which is called the artista technique. And as you see, this is more, um, more of a matte finish and it's more flat where it looks like uh, the design is uh, simply painted onto the top of the clay. And here we have examples of a molded technique, which is very much like the first tiles that I showed you, uh, where the design would be um, carved into a plaster mold and the clay would then be rolled out on top of it in relief. And so the, um, the flowers that you see here would be very deeply carved into the plaster and then the, um, the cavern would be filled with the clay um, rolled on top to create this uh, beautiful, what we call high relief. Can get a little close up there. And again, the beautiful painting and the high gloss finish. This one up here, corn, is an example of a uh, border tile. So here's the answer to part of the question that was going on in my head as I'm looking at these tiles. Um, I know that uh, you know many of these tiles uh, date back to like the 1500s, and so just like with the painting uh, during that time, which would have been around the Renaissance, um, I know that painting pigments were taken from the earth and um, and mixed, but in the case of underglazes, I um, I'm not sure, but this answers part of the question. You see the process here of cutting the slab of clay, and then uh, there is a, um, uh, what is it, there's something put on here, 
do, 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 tin oxide. Tin oxide is then put onto the slab. We let it dry and that creates the, the white surface. And then here we uh, take a picture that we want to repeat. I hope you can see without that glare. There we go. Um, a picture is drawn onto a piece of paper and then it is pricked with a pin. And then inside this bag we have charcoal, which is what, uh, and then that charcoal would get pounced so that it goes on, transfers the design onto the tile. Um, this little rabbit's foot here is used to uh, erase any uh, mistakes or uh, wayward charcoal. Um, and then here uh, we start to paint and carefully apply the colors um, of these, uh, I'm assuming underglazes, I don't know where they come from, I'm assuming they're also natural pigments. Um, so we start to apply those onto the tile. And you see though that um, you see the, the yellow and uh, the, the gray here uh, after the firing actually turns to blue. That's one of the real fun things about um, ceramics is once you put them in the high temperature kiln, um, it's like Christmas, you don't know what you're gonna get. In this room, we have uh, hand-painted tiles in uh, what I believe is the Niolica style. Um, these are examples of polychromes, which the colors are only uh, usually blue, green, and yellow. Um, I think the colors look kind of, there we go. I think you can see them better um, when I zoom in a bit. You see these beautiful, beautiful patterns. Um, these are more uh, 17th century tiles. The uh, church was always the, um, the, the biggest um, collector uh, commissioned the beautiful patterns, pattern walls that we see here. And uh, generally the more intricate patterns, like you would do with the painting, um, the more intricate patterns were down below where you could see them and they got a little less exciting as they went north. This reminds me of a quilt. It looks like it could be a nice soft quilt to go on your lap on the sofa. This room is displaying some more beautiful polychromes in uh, yellow, blue, and green. And as you see, this one is a, a narrative portrait of um, Our Lady of Conception. This is uh, done about 1650, 1675. And you see that um, the tiles were not only decorative, but they were narrative. These beautiful uh, paintings and illustrations that uh, told stories and created memories for the people that enjoyed them. There had to be a lot of thought uh, put into you know, being able to, um, you, when, you, when you made the design uh, with the paper, it would have to be flipped to make sure that the design um, you know, was uh, transferred so that the four of these could go together as they are. These, so these things don't just happen. They had to be very, very well thought out and planned. Let's talk for a minute about the painting on some of these tiles. Um, this, uh, this piece here, this faience, is, it's called a polychrome faience. And this, this kind of cracks me up. If you uh, look down there at the fish, they're pretty strange with their giant wide open mouths. And if you look at the overall uh, painting quality, this seems to me like it was done by someone who was um, not what you would call a master painter, maybe, maybe more someone like me, like me, like a sort of a folk artist. Um, this tree over here, let's see if I can get the right direction. Do, 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 do. There it is. This tree here makes me think of, uh, it looks like a paintbrush rather than a tree to me. And um, it's, uh, if you just look at the line quality, it's, it's not what we would call a uh, super professional, but it is um, very loose and broad in its, um, in its brush strokes and in its line quality. And um, beautiful, of course, in itself. These are, um, these are symbols of, let me see, these are a panel. It's an Azules panel with moral emblems. So it's sort of a, um, just a, sort of a, a conglomeration of different emblems um, depicting uh, the morality of the day. Now let's look at this one in contrast to the, um, the maritime scene that we, we just saw. This is a, a religious um, depiction, obviously, but let's just, just look at in quality, in terms of quality of the painter and technique 
and ability. You see that the lines in this one are much finer. The, um, the transfers, the transitions from light to dark are quite a bit more, um, more sophisticated and the faces of the people are more, more defined and you see a lot more detail. You see a lot of detail and fine lines in those wings and the hair and look up there at that church top. Wow. Now people, ceramic people, <laughs> painters, let's just think about this for a minute. It blows my mind. You know, these tiles were made in uh, around the 1600s. And so you had these artists, like just think, I mean, what a miracle it is, ceramic people, that we just take dirt out of the ground and you harden it and then you paint it and then it becomes something incredible like this, right? Um, think about the planning that had to go into this. I'm sure that there was perhaps a, a full drawing that um, was, was followed. I, I'm gonna guess that perhaps they did an enlarging with squares kind of thing you know, where you just do the drawing and then you cut it into, um, you cut it into the number of squares that you want to use to um, enlarge it and uh, repeat it. So that's, that's my guess. Um, but it's, it's always mind boggling to me to, to look at the things that uh, people hundreds and hundreds of years ago were able to do. Aren't they beautiful? Oh my goodness, look at this. Wow, oh my goodness. Oh my, look at this. How is this possible, people? How? 1600s, like, okay, this is what we can do without television and internet, right? <laughs> okay, that's a little monstrous, but it's, it's still quite an achievement. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I think this thing is really garish, <laughs> but still, how amazing that they were able to make things like this. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Look at this, look at this. Wow. This I believe is the church. Wow. I'm trying to get more light on things here. Oh my goodness, look at this. This is incredible. Gonna be quiet in respect for the church now. And in this room now we find examples of these magnificent scenes painted with the famous azulejos or blue tiles. Uh, as you see on top, the um, large mural is painted with um, sort of washed out pigment where it has kind of a, a faded effect. Whereas at the bottom we see that the blue pigment is very, very strong. Um, and some parts muted with the pigment. These are just incredible examples of monochromatic painting. It's not an easy thing if you're a painter, you know, to get all these variations of uh, light and dark with, um, with one color. And not to mention the very skilled and beautiful um, designs and drawings. This is an entire room. Uh, apparently the height of the Azulejo painting was from, I think, like around the 1690s to 1750s. And this room is quite a testament to that. I don't know at what time, you see now, we're starting to have brown pigment uh, and incorporated into the blue tiles. And I don't know when that came along. This, um, this little diptych or whatever it is, I don't know what we call it, uh, I find quite hilarious. 
Um, when you look at these figures here, um, we see that it looks like these birds are, like this bird is kind of saying something to that one. And look at this, I, I guess this is maybe like a griffin or something. And I don't know where it's, oh, I see. I think it looks like it's trying to talk to that one over there. And they're just these weird bird animals, but have like human heads. And this one is apparently female, because <laughs> she's got boobs. And um, it looks like the artist had a very hard time uh, trying to get the perspective on the, the arms and, and look, at, <laughs> look at how the legs are. Um, and then it looks like it's trying to shoot an arrow at this griffin and, uh, and not having much success. And then if we come over here, like I have no idea what this is about. It looks like, sort of like a good and evil kind of thing. And then when we come over here, we see uh, we have these, these two ladies, looks like with some fruit. And the design uh, from the other side is repeated over here. But you can see, um, it looks like these, these faces are pretty much similar. I'll go back over here. Yeah, you see, they're pretty much similar. But this is kind of funny. Look at the face on this griffin. And then let's go over here to this one. And <laughs> this one looks like it just came off a bender or it's very confused. <laughs> and then this, this kind of cracks me up too because this looks like this, whatever it is, is trying to spear this little bitty bird with this, um, you know, with this big long spear. Um, and again, we have, the, we have the two birds talking over here. So um, yeah, it's, it's pretty entertaining. I don't know what the, what the allegory or the meaning of it all is, but um, uh, just through examining it, it's, it's kind of funny. And here in this room now we have the beginnings of what is called the uh, master period. As you can see, these are the blue on white tiles. Um, these began to be painted more uh, by master painters. The style was brought to um, uh, Portugal by the Portuguese. And you can see that the quality of the work is much, much more refined than what we've looked at in the past. Uh, this is the time when uh, the artists who were painting these tiles began to sign their names, and thus they're more refined painters, and we have the name of the master's period for these blue and white tiles. Whoa, I don't know what this is, but I'm immediately drawn to it, as you would expect because of all the bright colors. Wow, okay, this looks like something more out of a modern art museum than something ancient. Let's find out what's going on here. So let's see, that is, uh, it's called The Letter. Work inspired by uh, the Azulejos panel. It doesn't tell me why it's in all those funky colors and why it looks like it's melting or ripped paper or something. What do you think? Leave a, leave a comment um, down in the, in the comments section what you think about this piece. Do you think it's something that was uh, like a modern piece that was uh, made and brought in here? Or do you think that this is uh, an original artifact? Based on what we've seen already with the colors that were used, I'm gonna guess that this is more of a modern piece. And here we have some more examples of blue on white painting. These seem to be more um, folk art kind of style of painting and images. I could see these in my kitchen. Um, again, they're so pretty. Then when we look over here, wow, look at this again. This is blue and white painting on the white tiles. And just look at the exquisite use of light and darks here. Look at how much the figure has improved from some of the things that we saw before. The faces of the people are much more refined. I want to know when they took these tiles off of whatever building it came from, how they took the top ones off because I'm wondering if they were um, uh, already cut into the shapes that they are or if they had to be 
um, extracted by um, some sort of sawing instrument or something to cut them off. I think the square ones would be pretty easy, but if you look at the edges there, you see that um, they, they might have had a little difficulty extracting those and keeping the shapes. And now here in the 20th century, we have a style which I can uh, more relate to. As you know, I love bright colors, and um, this is so so painterly. It's um, it's done in a very loose style, like the um, like the early ones, the ones that we saw in the very beginning. Um, and I forget the name already, but this is uh, the style. It's kind of like Maolica. It's just painted onto the flat tile. Whereas then we go over here, and we have this. Oh, look at the, they're grasshoppers, how beautiful. And they are more in a, in a high relief and offer quite a bit of detail. And, and so you remember that they were carved into a plaster mold. Um, so all of these lines here, all the things that are raised up would have been carved into the mold and the clay put in there. Um, and again, flip-flopped to create the different patterns for them to go together. Wow, and talk about a departure from tradition. Uh, these pieces were done around the 1950s, and you know, if you know anything about your art history, there was a lot of experimentation going on there in painting and um, in society and uh, in advertising. Um, so it was a it was a brave new world in art, and uh, this tile artist took full advantage of that. So now I will leave you with uh, just a stroll through some of the more modern tiles that are on display here. Tell me if you love them or hate them. Tell me what you've seen so far at, at this little trip that, that, you, um, that you really loved or hate, or if you have questions about anything that I said or explained. Um, gotta get over that person's head. Oh, look at this. This is a little Escher-like, isn't it? Oh, it's kind of really 3D, really cool. Oh, look at this one. Wow, really, really hopping off from the traditional tiles here. The mystery has been solved. On one hand, I think these pieces seem a little um, chaotic and garish, but on the other hand, I think it's um, uh, quite an interesting take, modern, super modern take on the traditions of tiles in Portugal. What are your thoughts? Don't forget, leave a comment below. Tell me what you're thinking. Well, my beautiful art lovers, I hope you had a nice time going through the museum with me. It is now, um, now that I've gone all the way through, it is now uh, wine o'clock. Drinking some of the beautiful red wine of Portugal, which cost me a whole, um, I don't know how, like in the US we would say $2.20, but in euros, I don't know how we say two euros and two euros or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, so anyway. I'm gonna make this a healthy drink. Um, I saw on um, our shared Amazon account that my daughter got this these uh, electrolyte drops. So I'm turning, well, my wine is already healthy because you know, it's good for your heart, right? And then I'm gonna use it to hydrate myself. So just want you all to know that I'm taking care of myself here in, in Portugal. Um, so that was the tour of the museum and I hope you really enjoyed it. I hope you'll um, give me some feedback and, and um, tell me in the comments how you liked it or didn't like it or if you have questions um i don't know everything i really don't know that much about the the history of tiles here in in portugal at all until i, I just came here um i do know that i lisbon I, I came back to lisbon after just being here in march because um it's such a textural and and beautiful city because of the tiles 
Um, not only are the um, walls of buildings inside and outside covered with decorative tiles, but uh, even the sidewalks um, have uh, beautiful designs in them uh, with, with hand, hand laid tiles. Um, something that we would never see in the United States. And um, as you saw, we went into the church, um, which I actually really thought was kind of garish with all that gold. And I really felt like it was kind of overdone. But at the same time, I always marvel at um, when I come into uh, these, these churches or, um, you know, like when I was in Rome looking at the, the Pantheon and, and the other, you know, sort of public old, old buildings that, um, you know, so long ago that people were able to create these, these buildings, these massive buildings and put paintings up on the ceilings and, um, you know, and, and, and like so much painting on the arches and, and reliefs and <coughs> mosaics. I mean, it's just mind boggling and crazy to me. In fact, when my niece and I were in uh, Palermo together and we were looking at all these buildings, I kept saying to her it had to be space aliens that built these because <laughs> how in God's name did people, were people able to, um, you know, like just make one pillar, you know, with, where like one base would weigh a ton, you know, and, and shape each one, you know, you had to just do it in chunks, right? Um, and, and shape them and then lift them one on top of the other, I'm assuming is, is how they did it, maybe. I'm sure they built scaffolding. I'm sure many, many people died because there were, you know, there's a lot of slavery going. Anyway, I digress. We're talking about tiles today. Anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed going through the museum as much as I did. Um, it is now my uh, intention with my YouTube channel to uh, not only continue to give, show you how to's in both painting and ceramics, which you know I'm a professional with, uh, but also as I travel around um, into different places, uh, I wanna show you and introduce you to uh, not just museums, but uh, artists that I meet along the way and perhaps galleries and uh, you know, I might be able to jump in and, and do some art myself in places that I visit. And uh, let's not forget festivals, right? Okay, so I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll come back. Um, be sure to like and subscribe. And you can also hit a notification bell if you want to know when I'm uh, dropping new videos, okay? All right, see y'all around.